I'm Cliff Chatterton of the War Amps. Of course, I served in the Army for some five years, and uh, you might wonder what I'm doing in the National Aviation Museum, sitting in front of one of the restored Lancasters. Well, now, some of you may have seen our documentaries. They have been mostly about the ground warfare. It's time to tell the story now of Bomber Command. Owen Harper, a guy I went to Kelvin High School with. We were great buddies. I joined the Army. He joined the Air Force. He was a flight engineer in Bomber Command. Owen and I, yeah, we survived that war. Years later, my thoughts returned to Owen, and I began to reminisce about the friends we had in high school. I made a telephone call to the librarian at the old high school. She told me there is a plaque dedicated to the memory of Kelvin students killed in the war. I asked her how many of them were in bomber command and she could tell me it was about 50. I was stunned. In fact, the very first Canadian to take part in an operational sortie as a lead navigator was from Kelvin High. Roger Henderson, I knew him well. Roger was killed in action a year later this documentary is dedicated to the Canadian volunteers in Bomber Command. 10,000 of them gave their lives. Now, we have to turn the story over to the younger generation, Chris Cook. He's a graduate of our CHAMP program. He's a quadruple amputee. Chris had a number of other passions, and one of them had to do with restoring a Lancaster bomber in his hometown. He's the obvious guy to do the narration for this important documentary, The Boys of Kelvin High. This Lancaster is the centerpiece of the Air Museum here in Nanton, Alberta. It is the only museum in Canada dedicated exclusively to those who served in Bomber Command. My personal interest goes back to when I was a kid in the War Amps Champ program. I learned what war was really like from those who were there, the War Amputees. In high school, I volunteered here and was intrigued by the stories of the Canadians who flew these bombers. Now, as a university history graduate, I'm involved in a program inspired by Cliff Chatterton and the War Amps called Operation Legacy. Champs, who have learned about Canada's military heritage from the War Amps, pass on the message to younger generations. The Allied bomber offensive lasted five years. Early on, Britain's European allies had fallen to the Third Reich. Its own cities had been bombed by Germany's Luftwaffe. The threat that the Allies could lose the war was very real. Bomber Command was seen as the only weapon capable of waging war against Hitler. We must first destroy the foundations upon which the German war machine runs, the economy which feeds it, the morale which sustains it, the supplies which nourish it, and the hopes of victory which inspire it. Bomber Command was ordered to destroy the enemy's industrial might. Poor weather conditions and limited navigational equipment made identifying targets difficult. Luftwaffe night fighters were taking their toll. Allied casualties mounted. Sir Winston Churchill was bitterly disappointed. So much hope rested on the bomber as an effective weapon. We must be able to overwhelm the Nazi homeland by this means, without which I do not see a way through. New tactics, better aircraft, and advanced technology improved the effectiveness of bombing raids. 
In 1942, under the leadership of Sir Arthur Harris, an offensive of strategic area bombing was aimed at industrial centers in the heart of Nazi Germany. A year later, at the Casablanca Conference, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to a combined Anglo-American bomber offensive, with the British Royal Air Force bombing by night and the U.S. 8th Army Air Force by day. The Casablanca Directive established the approach Allied bombing would take while plans were being made for a cross-channel invasion. The primary objective will be the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system, and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. This documentary focuses on the young Canadians who served in Bomber Command. They faced incredible odds with bravery and distinction. It's hard to imagine how the Allies could have won the war without them. It was 2,200 hours and we were on our first sortie. We climbed a height which took a while with a bomb load on board. When we approached the target area, we started our bombing run. The raid was already in full force with flak coming up all around the bombers ahead of us. As the bombers jockeyed for position, I could see how very easily mid-air collisions could occur, but I saw none that night. I don't think one is ever really prepared for one's first sortie when the enemy is firing real live shells at you. It seemed like an unreal world. I dropped our bombs in the center of the target. The official results indicated that the railway yards had been hit. We headed for home, always watchful that the enemy fighters would be on us at any minute. Seven Lancasters were lost that night. It was not unusual for crews to have only a few sorties and then go for the chop. This was the expression for being shot down. We arrived back over our base at 0500 hours, about seven hours after leaving. We had completed our first sortie. Only 29 more to go to complete our tour. With the odds we face, I will be dead soon. God, dead at 22 years of age. How awful, but I was seeing it every day. Behind me is an example of the training bases that appeared almost overnight across Canada at the outbreak of World War II. Today, this hangar in Brandon, Manitoba is a National Historic Site. It serves as the Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum, a unique memorial to those airmen who trained and served, and especially to those who died in the air war. In 1940, as Nazi bombers attacked Britain, the Royal Air Force had only limited resources to fight back. With the creation of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, Canada became the official training ground for the air crews Britain so desperately needed. Why Canada? It had wide open spaces and a suitable climate compared to the chronic bad weather in Britain. It was also far from the dangers of the battle zone. Recruits from Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada trained at schools and aerodromes set up in cities, towns, and farmers' fields across the country. It was a welcome boost to local economies hard hit by the Depression. 
nearly half of the air and ground crews in all of the Commonwealth Air Forces were trained in Canada. Young men lined up at the recruiting offices motivated by patriotism or a sense of duty. Some were inspired by World War I flying aces like Canadian hero Billy Bishop. They were miners, lumberjacks, trappers and farmers. Many were just out of high school. Most had never been in an airplane. They are between 18 and 24 years of age. They chose the Air Force over the Navy and the Army. Most of them share a dream. They picture themselves soaring through the skies on mighty planes, engaging the Fuhrer's minions in mortal combat. The BC ATP's task is to direct those rookies towards a training that match their skills, to provide discipline without hampering their resolution to impart the know-how needed to conduct dangerous flight missions, to teach the reflexes that may save their lives and of their crewmates. Recruits followed an intensive schedule of classroom and flight training. Air crew members were turned out at a fast pace, ready to serve overseas. Ground crew staff, including volunteers from the RCAF Women's Division, were trained to keep the bombers and bases operating. Due to the massive presence of the air training plan in this country, the Air Force was the preferred choice for tens of thousands of young Canadians. This major commitment to the war, and particularly to Bomber Command, would exact a heavy toll in Canadian casualties. The British Commonwealth Air Training Plan was a major undertaking. It trained the crews that won victory in the air and is considered one of Canada's proudest achievements of World War II. June 26, 1940. Reported to the RCAF Manning Depot in Toronto. Time to get introduced to military life, including a good haircut and endless drills. From here, we'll be sent to a training school for airmen or a training camp for ground personnel. August 7th. We're partway through our 10 weeks of courses at number one initial training school. Soon it will be selection day. That's when they'll choose who will become pilots who will be trained as navigators, bomb aimers, wireless operators, and gunners. Many of us have dreams of being a pilot, the job with the most prestige. I had my first experience with a link trainer. It's a stationary machine that moves up, down, and sideways and can even spin and crash. It's so realistic, it can make recruits sick, which doesn't improve their chances for pilot training. August 29th. My dreams of being a pilot were shattered today. I've been told I will train as a wireless operator. That's the trade most needed now. I'm disappointed, but the Air Force decides the position to which you are assigned. There is no appealing. September 16th, posted to number two wireless school in Calgary. We'll soon be settling in to hours of instruction on Morse code and radio theory. Looking forward to some hands-on work with radio transmitters and the Aldous signaling lamp. November 24th, receive first promotion to leading aircraftman. I now make $1.40 a day. We wear a silver cloth propeller on our sleeves now and are starting to feel more like real Air Force men. This base is crawling with Aussies, New Zealanders, Brits and Canadians. When we get the chance, we hit the restaurants and dance halls in the towns nearby. Folks have given us a warm welcome and there's plenty of romance with the local girls. January 13th, 1941. 
back east now at number one bombing and gunnery school, Jarvis, Ontario. We're about to climb into battle-tested aircraft like the Ferry Battle to learn flying tactics and air gunnery. By the way, I'm getting used to the British slang. Guys are called blokes, dangerous flight is a shaky do, and everything good or well done is wizard. The Americans have their terms too. They don't have operations, they have missions. We say bombs gone, they say bombs away. February 17th. We've graduated as full-fledged wireless operators and I've been promoted to the rank of sergeant. My pay is now $3.70 a day. Heading off for three weeks leave. Time for us to say goodbye to parents and sweethearts before heading off to war and the unknown. Once the air crew finished their training, they were shipped overseas to operational training units in England. Here, they would familiarize themselves with the aircraft they would be flying on operations. It was also the time to select the crews. When we arrived at OTU, we were all marched into a hangar, and the wing commander in charge of training made a speech that went something like this. Well, chaps, in one week's time, you will be reassembled here. At that time, I will call out the pilot's name, and he will tell me the names of his crew. If he does not have one, I will assign him one. I'll leave you to it then. Good luck. Well, all the various aircrew trades began looking each other over. In a very casual way, of course. The reason for anyone wanting to crew up with certain individuals was self-preservation, pure and simple. You wanted to have crew members with you who were good at their jobs under the stress of operational conditions. The whole process was done informally, choosing fellows who had common interests or who would handle themselves well in the classroom. One pilot chose his tail gunner solely on the basis that they were both avid rugby fans. It was not uncommon in many crews for the pilot to have a non-commissioned rank of a sergeant, while others in the crew might have received commissions as officers. During operations, though, the pilot was the skipper in charge. In his aircraft, all crew, regardless of rank, were under his command. Flying a four-engine bomber through heavy enemy flak night after night led to a sometimes fiery but very strong crew who readily adopted the age-old principle, all for one and one for all. This is not to suggest that they went about clapping each other on the back in a hearty Hollywood Three Musketeers atmosphere. There was, however, an underlying kinship. They were sharing the same perils. The bond merged with a natural liking, and a feeling approaching that of the closest blood relationship took root. At the outset, Canadians served in bomber squadrons of Britain's Royal Air Force. From a political standpoint, the Canadian government wanted a separate bomber group of its own, with squadrons that would be manned and commanded by Canadians. In January 1943, Canadian No. 6 Group became the first non-British formation to become part of RAF Bomber Command. It reported directly to Bomber Command headquarters in High Wycombe. Until the end of the war, though, a large number of Canadians would continue to serve in British squadrons. Canadians accounted for approximately 25% of RAF's bomber crews. Six Group headquarters was at Allerton Park near Linton-on-Ouse in Yorkshire. 
Allerton Hall was the main building. It was the ancestral home of Lord Mowbray. The Canadians promptly named it Castle Dismal. The 15 squadrons that made up 6 Group were based at several airfields nearby. Air Vice Marshal Clifford McEwen took over control of 6 Group. He was a stickler for discipline and training and lost no time in making his presence felt. He intensified cross-country and bombing exercises, lectures and drills. McEwen was determined to make 6 Group the best in bomber command. During 6 Group's first year, three of its squadrons were sent on loan to the Mediterranean Theater to take part in the invasion of Sicily and Italy. There, as 331 Wing RCAF, they bombed airfields, harbors, and rail junctions in preparation for the Allied landings. After this tough but successful campaign, they returned to England and rejoined 6 Group. Canadian 6 Group started out with a grim casualty rate. With better equipment, training and experience, the situation was reversed. At the end of 1944, 6 Group was bearing a large brunt of the air offensive over Northwest Europe and had the lowest casualties of any group in Bomber Command. In just two years, from its inception to the end of the war, 6 Group flew more than 40,000 sorties. Today, Allerton Hall is restored. A memorial garden is dedicated to the Canadians who gave their lives. Early in the war, the only aircraft available to Bomber Command were twin-engined and included the Hampton and the Wellington. The Wellington was affectionately named Wimpy after the Popeye comic strip character J. Wellington Wimpy. Later came the four-engined heavies. The Sterling was the largest of the heavy bombers, introduced during the darkest days of the war. It was a symbol of Britain's growing aerial offensive power. The Halifax was a sturdy and reliable aircraft, well liked by its crews. It was used successfully until the end of the war. A Halifax bomber is now being restored at the RCAF Memorial Museum at Trenton, Ontario, as a tribute to the Canadians who flew Halleys. The Halifax became overshadowed by the Lancaster, which was capable of carrying ever-increasing bomb loads. The Lancaster was the most successful aircraft used by Bomber Command. It had speed, sealing, and lifting power that no other aircraft of the day could match. 430 Lancasters were built in Canada. On August 6, 1943, Victory Aircraft turned out its first Lancaster called the Ruhr Express. With much fanfare, the aircraft was flown to England by squadron leader Reg Lane, who had just completed two tours of operations and was about to start his third. He was one of the war's most decorated Canadians at the time. The Lancaster was built for bombing. As you can see, crew comfort and security were secondary considerations. A man had just enough room to do his job and no more. There was no air conditioning, little heating, and no pressurization. 
When it went into a fast bomber dive, the pressure on the eardrums was severe. The lank vibrated heavily, and the loud drone of the four big engines was deafening. It had no defensive armor and flew under the cover of darkness. A Lancaster crew numbered seven, the pilot, flight engineer, navigator, wireless operator, bomb aimer, mid-upper gunner, and rear gunner. The pilot was always in command of the aircraft. The safety of the crew depended on his skill and leadership. Seated beside the pilot was the flight engineer. He assisted the pilot on takeoffs and landings by handling the throttles. In flight, he monitored the oil, fuel, and pressure gauges. Behind the pilot and flight engineer, the navigator worked in a curtained off compartment, so his lights would not give away their position to enemy fighters. He was constantly plotting the aircraft's course and making adjustments. He had to know his aircraft's position at any time, regardless of wind, weather, or enemy action. The bomb aimer's compartment was in the front of the aircraft, below the main cockpit. Lying on his stomach and looking through the bomb sight out of the large perspex bubble, he had the best view. The bomb aimer's job was to guide the aircraft to the target and release the bomb load. He did this using a bomb sight which recorded essential data like wind direction, speed, and height. The wireless operator's station was in the rear of the cockpit section. He maintained a listening watch on the radio set, picking up messages from home base and sending out replies. He also received radio signals from ground stations in the UK so he could give their bearings to the navigator. The mid-upper gunner and rear gunner were responsible for the defense of the aircraft. Separated from the rest of the crew, they remained cramped at their machine gun posts for the entire flight. Their primary role was not to shoot down enemy aircraft. Rather, it was to perform the role of a lookout. When they spotted enemy fighters, they would instruct the pilot to take evasive action. Their 303 caliber guns were no match for the Luftwaffe night fighters. There was no heat in the tail turret, and the space between the guns was open for sighting. At night and at 20,000 feet, the temperature often fell to minus 40 degrees. Despite their electrically heated suits, the rear gunners often suffered from frostbite. As part of their flying gear, crew members wore oxygen masks and an inflatable life vest called a Mae West, named after the Hollywood movie queen. Each man had his own responsibilities, but survival depended on working together as a crew in total support of each other. necessary to have the utmost confidence in the ground crews who had serviced their aircraft. Ground crews on a bomber station maintained and repaired the kites night and day in all kinds of weather. The responsibility for maintenance of an aircraft was given to the head mechanic, who went by the loving term of chiefy. The ground crews were called irks, a term derived from the abbreviation AIRC for aircraftmen. Trades included engine fitters, airframe mechanics, and electronics engineers. Armorers loaded the bombs and made sure the fusing mechanisms were correct. Members of the RCAF Women's Division, formerly known as WAFs, worked as drivers and telephone operators. Many were trained to interpret reconnaissance and bombing photographs. They were also mechanics, parachute riggers, and meteorologists. There was a very close tie based on the highest level of respect from the ground crews to the air crews who had to take the kites on such dangerous operations. It is heart-wrenching to hear the stories about how the ground crews would remain along the runway, giving the thumbs up to their departing comrades, some of whom were heading into what could be a fiery death. 
There was as well a very high risk of danger for ground crews in fueling the aircraft and loading the bombs. Sometimes bombs would detonate on the ground. And there are countless stories of plane crashes on the bases, particularly if the aircraft had come under heavy fire. Ground crews for days talked about those terrible incidents when they had to assist in lifting dead and wounded air crew from an aircraft to the waiting ambulance. Many times, ground crew members risked their lives to save others. I always made it my duty to give credit to the ground crew because I always felt very pleased when my aircraft came back from a trip and the aircraft had performed well for me. The ground crew didn't get nearly as much credit as the air crew did. They were crackerjack mechanics. They were unsung heroes, really. Oh, 0700 hours. Day is beginning for the ground staff at a bomber command station on the bleak windswept coast of eastern England. The target information for tonight has been received. Oh, 0800 hours. Armorers roll out the bombs and mount them on trolleys. Others pack the cases of incendiaries that will surround the high explosive bombs when they are winched into the bomb bay. Armament crews feed tens of thousands of cartridges into the ammunition boxes, which will service the turrets. It will be mid-afternoon before the fueling of the squadron's bombers is complete. Mechanics check every part. Engines, instruments, hydraulic systems. Maintenance crews are at work until minutes before takeoff. 1100 hours. At station headquarters, the commanding officer and his staff check weather forecasts and plan the night's operation. They work against time for the afternoon briefing. 1300 hours. The curtain is pulled back to reveal a map of the target. The crews receive information on precise courses, enemy defenses, tactics, timing, radio frequencies, and weather forecasts. Maps are issued to navigators and bomb aimers. 1400 hours. Following the traditional meal of bacon and eggs, the crews are issued their flying gear, escape kits, and parachutes. 1,500 hours. Crews are driven out to their aircraft. Once on board, the men grope their way along a dark, narrow fuselage and settle down to the long pre-flight checklists. If all is well, the flight engineer gives the traditional thumbs up to the ground crew. 1,600 hours. As daylight fades, the four Merlin engines sputter to life. The aircraft taxis to the end of the runway, and the takeoff run starts. It is nerve-wracking for the crew as the aircraft strains to lift its tremendous bomb and fuel loads. Dusk is gathering as the bomber flies inland and circles for an hour, striving for altitude. Then, at a set moment, the bomber stream turns eastward toward enemy territory. The bombers travel in a stream of numerous aircraft, close together and traveling the same course. The chance of a mid-air collision is high. The German defenses are on alert. Twenty hundred hours. The climax of every trip is the run over the target. The bomb aimers give instructions for the bomb bay doors to be opened and guide the pilot for the final few minutes of the bomb run. The aircraft lift 100 feet as their loads are released. Cameras on the aircraft are timed to take photographs of the point of impact. 
These images will be studied later to determine accuracy. Then the bomb doors are closed, and the weaving to avoid fighters begins again as they turn onto a westerly course for home. The bomber's best defense is cloud and darkness. The crew of a badly hit bomber has a one in five chance of escaping alive. 2,400 hours. Through the treacherous fog, the English coast is sighted. Ground staff cheer as their own aircraft approaches. Others anxiously await crews who will be lucky to complete 10 trips in these grim days. Longer routes, bad weather, and the success of the Luftwaffe defenses have all contributed to increased casualties. Stiff and weary after the grueling eight-hour flight, the airmen head for the debriefing hut. Another operation has been completed. One more day of war is over. crews were encouraged to evade capture if they parachuted or crash landed. With the assistance of the civilian underground, two major European escape routes were set up by British military intelligence, the O'Leary Line and the Shelburne Line. Together, they helped hundreds of airmen and soldiers evade capture. A third line, called the Comet Line, was organized and staffed by members of the underground resistance movements and civilians in the occupied countries. The escape line started in Brussels, where the airmen were fed, clothed, and given false identity papers. A network of 1,000 people then guided the men south through occupied France, into neutral Spain, and home via British-controlled Gibraltar. The Comet line is credited with saving more than 800 Allied airmen. Resistance fighters took huge risks. Those who were caught faced execution or concentration camps. Ray de Pape, a 20-year-old pilot with Canadian 6 Group's 431 Squadron, bailed out of his burning aircraft over Belgium in 1943. He managed to hook up with the Comet Line and was escorted across the Spanish border to Gibraltar and freedom two months later. I was helped by a multitude of people. A lot of them were young and many were women. While they were all volunteers, they realized the risk they were taking to help us in our evasion and escape Every move they made could cost them their lives. This was their contribution to the Allied cause and eventually to their own freedom. The Natten Museum includes a display of local airmen who were killed overseas. One of them was my uncle, Glenn Ransom. He was a pilot with the Pathfinders. The Pathfinder Force was a hand-picked corps of crews highly skilled in navigation. Led by Australian bomber pilot Donald Bennett, this elite force was part of the solution to the costly problems bomber crews had in finding their targets. Pathfinder crews were volunteers doing their second tour of operations each member of the crew was promoted by one rank and wore a special gold wing on the left-hand pocket of his uniform. Their job was to fly ahead of the main bomber formations to locate and mark the targets with incendiary bombs. They were equipped with a new blind bombing device, codenamed Obo. It depended on signals transmitted from ground stations in England. 
Two beams could be laid with great accuracy over targets, and a receiver in the bomber guided it exactly to this point. The pathfinders used different colored markers, mainly red, yellow, and green. Leading the pathfinders on each raid were the master bombers. They circled the target area, giving instructions to the backing up pathfinders and the main force so that the bombing did not go astray. The twin-engined Mosquito aircraft was especially suited for this task. Made of lightweight plywood, the Mosquito was faster than a heavy bomber and had a better chance of avoiding enemy flak. The Canadians developed their own master bombers. The best known were Johnny Fouquier of Ottawa and Reg Lane from Victoria. Both men had served as wing commanders of 405 Squadron, the Canadian Six Group Squadron assigned to the Pathfinders. A master bomber was just like a traffic cop. It was his job to go in with specially colored flares and drop them on the aiming point. He would broadcast on a selected frequency to all the bombers coming in and he would tell them where to bomb in relation to his markers. Along the raid, if his markers would burn out, he would stop the raid, drop some more, and would again instruct the bomber force where to drop their bombs. He stayed until the raid was over. The gallantry of the Pathfinder force is legendary. With the prestige came great risk and danger. Casualties averaged twice those on main force squadrons. The red tapes on the map of Germany showed our route to be the Ruhr Valley, called Happy Valley by the air crews because of the casualties already suffered from raids on the heavily defended area. Cities in the Ruhr harbored the highest percentage of coal, steel, and chemical factories in Germany, so it was defended with the heaviest concentration of flak and night fighters in Europe. Announcements of targets in that area were usually greeted with grimaces and a few audible groans from assembled crews. Although raids were conducted over the Ruhr Valley throughout the war, a sustained effort known as the Battle of the Ruhr in 1943 included large-scale and repeated attacks on industrial cities. Targets included the armaments industry, oil production and steel plants, aircraft assembly facilities, and munitions factories. After our raid on Cologne, I finished my logbook and tried to get some sleep. I found it hopeless. I could not get the sight out of my mind. One of our wimpies had been caught in a cone of three searchlights. Suddenly, he exploded and became a monstrous red and brown expanding ball. Pieces of the aircraft fell through the searchlight beams, sparkling in the white light. Later that night, that wimpy would be marked FTR or failed to return on the board in the ops room. This was indeed the final loss of our innocence. The Battle of the Ruhr was the first major bombing campaign involving Six Group. It was a testing time for the Canadians and a period of high casualties. For Bomber Command as a whole, the Ruhr campaign was considered an impressive victory. Serious damage was done to German war production and communications were disrupted. 
It marked the first time Bomber Command had mounted a truly effective series of consistent and pulverizing blows on the enemy, with failures much rarer than the successes. The Battle of Hamburg followed closely after the Ruhr. The intent was to destroy the major port city and its U-boat construction, oil refineries, factories, and chemical plants. In the span of 10 nights, Hamburg was attacked by four massive RAF nighttime raids and two daylight ones by the U.S. 8th Army Air Force. The level of devastation was enormous. Goebbels termed the firestorm a catastrophe that staggers the imagination. The city had been destroyed in a manner unparalleled in history. Albert Speer, Hitler's armaments minister, wrote that he believed that the same treatment meted out to half a dozen more cities would put an end to the war. Bomber Command maintained that strategic area bombing at night was the most effective way to destroy the industrial might of Germany. The U.S. 8th Army Air Force concentrated the efforts of its fortress and liberator bombers on daytime attacks on industrial targets. Accuracy was a relative term. Neither Bomber Command nor the USAAF were ever able to achieve the kind of precision bombing that would have permitted them to avoid the destruction of cities and the death or injury of large numbers of civilians. When Harris and the others argued for area bombing with the aiming point in the center of the cities, they were basing their analysis on evidence which demonstrated that precision attacks were possible only under extraordinary circumstances. In 1954, a British war film called The Downbusters had crowds going to theaters in droves. It was based on the true story of the famous raids on the dams in the Ruhr Valley. The Downbusters is very much a Canadian story, too. In 1943, the Allies needed a boost. The war had been dragging on for three and a half years. Then came plans for Operation Chastise, a raid on the German hydroelectric dams, which provided much needed power and water for industries in the Ruhr Valley. The dams were the Muna, the Ader, and the Sorpa. British scientist Barnes Wallace realized that to do any damage to the thick concrete walls of the Great Dams, an entirely new type of bomb would be required. Wallace designed a bouncing bomb, which had to be released at low level and high speed. It would skip along the water until it struck the dam wall. It would then rotate backwards and down the wall where it would explode, causing the dam to collapse. The Lancaster was the only aircraft capable of delivering the weapon. The air crew selected for the raids included the best in bomber command. Under legendary British Wing Commander Guy Gibson, they formed 617 Squadron, later to become famous as the Dam Busters. Gibson handpicked the 133 airmen for this special squadron. 29 of them were Canadian, including pilot Ken Brown of Moose Jaw and navigator Terry Tarum of Calgary. The squadron trained for eight weeks. To deliver the bombs properly, pilots would have to descend rapidly to 60 feet and then maintain that low altitude at 240 miles per hour, dropping their loads about 450 yards from the dam. 
all in the dark of night. It was an extraordinarily dangerous operation with no room for error. May 16th, 1943. As darkness approached, Gibson took off to lead 617 Squadron to the dams. of the 19 aircraft were lost that night. 56 men became casualties, including 13 Canadians killed. Despite the high cost, the raid was judged by Bomber Command as a triumph. The Muna and Ader dams had been breached and caused massive flooding. The Sorpa Dam was damaged. Water and power supplies were disrupted. For the enemy, it meant rebuilding the dams, bridges, railways, and factories, which took resources away from the war effort. The dams raid was a great morale booster for the Allies and especially for Bomber Command. Guy Gibson was awarded the Victoria Cross for his outstanding leadership. Ken Brown received the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal for making a total of 10 runs under heavy fire before releasing his bombs successfully on the Sorpa Dam. Terry Terham received the Distinguished Flying Cross for his action in navigating Gibson's aircraft. He became a hero in his hometown of Calgary. There were only a few examples during Bomber Command's offensive that could properly be called precision bombing, and almost all of them were carried out by 617 Squadron. The breaching of the dams was one. The sinking of the battleship Tirpitz was another. The German Navy's massive Tirpitz lurked in Norwegian waters, threatening Allied convoys bound for Russia. Attempts had been made to sink her with little success. Barnes Wallace was called upon once again to build a special bomb for the job, a 12,000-pound weapon called the Tallboy, designed to pierce the battleship's armor plating. The Dambuster Squadron and Canadian Jack Singer's No. 9 Squadron were chosen to deliver it. Our squadron operated in conjunction with 617 Squadron, the elite squadron of Bomber Command. Normally, we were not sent on the regular raids to do bombing of big industrial cities, but were assigned almost exclusively to pinpoint bombing on special military targets. It was generally necessary to do daylight raids so the targets could be clearly identified. The tall boy bombs were low in production, and so the targets had to be of a high priority nature. With the tall boy in the bomb bay, our total takeoff weight was 67,000 pounds. It was a very short runway, less than 5,000 feet. I can remember in our briefing, the CEO saying in typical British understatement, hold the aircraft on the ground right to the end of the runway, lads, and then lift it off smartly. You're a bit overweight, you know. On the last of three attacks in the fall of 44, 30 Lancasters from the Dam Busters and No. 9 Squadron approached the Tirpitz on a wide detour from inland, confusing the enemy fighters. The tall boys were released. The explosion capsized the battleship. With the sinking of the Tirpitz, Hitler lost the last influential ship of his surface battle fleet. It would be difficult to adequately describe the work and dedication required by the squadrons to finally achieve this victory. The Tirpitz had been sunk, and we were all proud of our part in it. Through adversity to the stars, the model for the Royal Canadian Air Force embraces the challenges faced by the volunteers who confronted Hitler's mighty defenses. These young men, scarcely out of school, displayed great skill in getting the huge bombers to the targets and back. Many veterans have told me how confident they felt flying the Lancaster. They knew the aircraft inside and out and felt it was the best in bomber command. 
Despite the dangers, many volunteered for second and third tours. They were under no illusions. Each trip could be their last. They viewed sorties as dangerous but necessary. Following the unofficial motto of Bomber Command, their job was to press on regardless. Operation Legacy pays tribute to these volunteers who risked all in the fight for freedom. The story of Canadians in Bomber Command will continue in part two of the boys of Kelvin High. The age of electronic warfare, the raid on the V-1 and V-2 rocket sites, the Battle of Berlin, and finally, the part about D-Day. For the air crews and the ground crews who serviced them, there would be many more sorties before the surrender of Hitler's Nazi regime.